Hi, I'm Denshi, and welcome to this comfy guide to GPG, a popular command line encryption tool for Linux and other operating systems. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to create your very own encryption keys and how to use those keys to encrypt files, encrypt messages, and also verify and sign digital signatures. Now, before I get into all that, I want to give a basic overview of how encryption actually works on your computer. More specifically, something called asymmetric encryption. Imagine that we have two people called Billy and Amy. And Billy wants to send Amy a message over here, like this little letter, over the internet. Now, if Billy just sends this unencrypted information over the internet, then anybody listening to the connection can actually see all the contents, all the zeros and ones of this letter. So that includes your ISP and anyone performing a man in the middle attack, which is basically when you look at a connection and see what's going on and analyze the data. So obviously this is not secure for sending any kind of sensitive information. So then we can move on to something more advanced called symmetric encryption. So what Billy can do is you can essentially put a padlock on the message and lock it using a password. So say they agree, Billy and Amy agree on some kind of password like one, two, three, Four. Now, obviously, in real life, you'd use a much safer password than that. But if Billy and Amy are able to meet up in real life and set aside some time to come up with a good password for their email or whatever the messages that they're going to send to each other, then Billy can just start using that password and sending this message and everything is fine. And in fact, when Amy wants to send any other message back, she can just use the same password and send it back. Now, the only problem with this is, well, the in real life part. If Billy and Amy can meet in real life to exchange a password, they can probably exchange other information such as what was in the message. So what would actually happen in a typical scenario is that you'd send the password over the internet. So one, two, three, four will be sent over an unencrypted connection on the internet. And now we've just encountered the exact same problem as before, because anybody can just have a look at this connection over here, read the password, and then use that password to decrypt the information being sent with the supposedly encrypted email. So symmetric encryption is actually not safe at all if you're giving away the password on the internet. Now this is where we get something very advanced called asymmetric encryption. So last time we essentially had one padlock that we use to lock the message, kind of like a metaphor for encryption. So essentially the password would be a key to open this padlock. And because you're sharing both of these over the internet, obviously this is not a secure setup. But using asymmetric encryption, what Billy can do is he generates his own set of padlock and key. And Amy also generates her own padlock and key. Now, in encryption terms, this padlock is known as a public key, and this key over here that unlocks the padlock is known as a secret or a private key. So when sending the message over, what Billy can do is he can request Amy's public key. So Amy sends over a copy of the public key, and Billy gets the public key. And what Billy does is he encrypts the message using the public key. So now the message is encrypted using Amy's key, and now Billy can send it over. And once it's sent over, since Amy has a secret key, she can put it in the lock and unlock the message. And she gets the message just like that. Because the secret key is kept secret, Amy never shares it with anybody, then nobody can actually decrypt this message besides Amy. So by having two sets of keys and padlocks, you can actually avoid the entire problem of symmetric encryption where the password is shared over the internet. Now obviously if Amy wanted to send a different message to Billy back, uh, what can happen is, say this blue message over here, Billy can share his padlock, his public key with Amy, and she can encrypt that blue message. Then that message can reach Billy and Billy can unlock it with his key and get the message unlocked just like that. So the secret key must be kept secret. And the public keys, you can make as many copies as you want. You can put them wherever you want on the internet. It doesn't matter because all the public keys can do is encrypt stuff. I want you guys to think of a public key as an actual physical padlock. So when you put a padlock on a bike or on a drawer or on something that you want to close without the key, well, you can't really open it. Now, obviously in real life, you can pry it open forcibly and whatever, but in the cryptographic world, that's actually extremely difficult to do. You can't crack encryption unless you have a super powerful computer or some kind of quantum computer, which doesn't really exist yet. What Billy and Amy have devised here is an asymmetric encryption scheme that allows them to 
commit to perfectly secure communication. Now, this is the same technology that's used in your browser when you have a little secure padlock over here. It's using something called SSL encryption, which uses asymmetric encryption protocols. All right, so now that I've talked about the theory of asymmetric encryption, let's find out how we can use the actual GPG tool to make our very own public and private keys. So to create a key, all you need to do is run gpg dash dash full dash gen dash key and press enter. And the first thing you're gonna be prompted is a type of key. So we're gonna choose the ECC key, which is the safer type of key. RSA is actually an older standard, which we don't really wanna be using anymore. But in short, I'm gonna just press enter over here and select the default selection. All right, now for the elliptic curve, once again, I'm just gonna select the default one since that's pretty much all that we really need. If you wanna look more into the different types of elliptic curves, you're free to do that on your own time. But in this video, I'm just gonna press enter. All right. Now we can select a expiration date. Now this is very useful if you're somebody who wants to be very secure and you wanna make sure that your key is constantly being swapped out. And in this case, I'm just gonna set it to not expire since we're just doing an example over here. But in real life, if you wanted more security, you might set this to like, I don't know, one Y, which would be one year, for example. So I'm gonna just press enter over here because it's default. It's gonna tell you that the key does not expire at all. And I'm gonna press Y over here, which says that it is correct. All right. So now we're gonna construct a user identity. I'm gonna say uh, Billy John as the real name. Email address, I'm gonna do billyj at example.org, just like that. And comment, um, how about Billy's super cool key, exclamation mark. That, that's a pretty good comment. All right, so now we have this user ID. We can go and actually add new ones to the key, but we can't really modify them once they're in the key. And this has to do with how fingerprinting and also signing and verifying messages, how that works. So if you're not sure about this, make sure you go back and change it. And also, if you're wondering about the email, you don't have to set a real email here, but it's recommended because you can use GPG over email and essentially use it to encrypt your emails in a very secure way. But we're not gonna be doing that in today's video, so I'm just gonna pick this random email which doesn't exist. Now, since this is all okay, I'm gonna select O, which is for okay. And now it's gonna ask me for a passphrase here at the top of the screen. Now you do not have to set a passphrase, but if you do set a passphrase, if somebody happens to steal your computer or steal your secret key, then that person would have an additional layer of symmetric encryption to have to deal with. So if I set my password to something really secure, even if somebody stole the file to my secret key, that individual would not be able to actually use that secret key unless that person knew what the password was. Now in today's video, I'm gonna be really stupid. I'm gonna set it to one, two, three, four, because it's just an example, but you should set a very secure password here. So I'm gonna press okay, and it's obviously gonna give me a warning because I set it to one, two, three, four, and I'm gonna do take this one anyway because it's just an example. All right, so as you can see, it's given us some information over here. It's created something called a revocation certificate. Now we're not really gonna be using this in today's video, but essentially you can publish this file on the internet to let people know that your key is no longer being used. And here's the actual information for the key. So we have the ED24519 uh, encryption standard elliptic curve thing over here, which isn't super important for us right now, but we have this thing over here, which is the keys fingerprint. So this fingerprint is essentially the ID for your key, and you can use it to edit your key later and all that if you forget the name of the key or the email, which you can also use to identify it. All right, so now that we've generated the key, we can go and actually start using it. All right, so I've created a directory called gpg over here, and in this directory, I've placed a file called picture.jpg. So if I open up this picture.jpg file, as you can see, it's a picture of a nice Italian town. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to encrypt and then decrypt this picture. I'm gonna use my own key in this example, uh, the Billy J, the adexample.org key that I created. But in real life, what you would be doing is actually encrypting this using somebody else's email or key fingerprint so that that individual can receive the message and not yourself. Unless of course you're encrypting the picture so that only you can see it and then you want to put it say on mega or on google drive or something like that so you can store it for long long periods of time without people actually knowing what's in your file so what we're going to do is we're going to use the gpg dash dash encrypt functionality and we're going to pass the parameter dash r which means recipient and we're going to set it to billyj at example.org then we're gonna select the file itself, which is picture.jpg. And if we press enter, 
it will give some report over here talking about what it did. And as you can see in the directory, we now have picture.jpg.gpg, just like that. Now, if we open up picture.jpg.gpg, as you can see, it's a bunch of random data. Uh, but if we try to open it up with the image viewer, uh, as you can see, it doesn't really open anything because it's just a bunch of useless information that makes no sense to anybody except GPG. So what we're going to do now is run GPG dash dash decrypt and then the file picture.jpg.gpg. And when we press enter over here, what's gonna happen is it's gonna ask us for the passphrase. Now, if you guys remember from the analogy that I did earlier, you need a secret key to decrypt something that was locked with the public key, or, or like a private key, if you wanna call it that instead of a secret key. Those two terms are basically interchangeable. And now we're gonna have to put the password for the key we created earlier to actually decrypt the file. So I'm gonna type one, two, three, four, because that's what we named it. After all, that's what we set the password to. And it's gonna wait a little bit. And as you can see, it literally just spat out the images information out into, into the terminal. What you can do to fix that is do dash dash output um, before the file name actually. Just make sure you put everything before the file name in GPG and give it a name like, I don't know, picture, decrypted.jpg, just like that. And then we're gonna put the input file at the very end, which is picture.jpg.gpg. So pressing enter, it should do it automatically because I've already put the password in and there's actually a cooldown timer. I think it's about a couple of minutes long for the secret key. And now if we list the directory, as you can see, we have a file called picture.decrypted.jpg. If we try to open up that file in our image viewer, as you can see, it's the exact same image of the Italian town. So we've encrypted and then decrypted that file. And if you were to share this GPG file um, over say Mega or Google Drive or something like that, and then you wanted to download it for later access, nobody at Google or Mega or like a cloud storage provider would be able to see the contents of that file. So you can do it in like a very, very secure way. All right. Now I'm gonna show you guys how you can encrypt a message very easily using GPG. So let's say I have a message and it's gonna be, hi guys, this is a uh, Billy, not Bully. Hi guys, this is Billy, and this is my encrypted message, just like that. So I'm gonna put a message like that that says, hi guys, this is Billy, and this is my encrypted message, full stop. So I can take this and I can pipe it over to GPG and I can do dash dash encrypt and then make sure you pass the dash dash armor option and then dash R and then your email. So billyj at example.org, just like that. So if we press enter, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get a bunch of garbled text over here that corresponds to our text message, but it's been encrypted. It's a PGP message, so you can't actually see what it is unless you have the decryption key. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna use the arrow over here, the angled arrow, to send it to a file called message.txt, or you know what, I'm gonna call it encrypted-message.txt, just like that. So if you press enter, now we're gonna have a file called encrypted-message.txt that has all this garble nonsense in it. So what you can do is use the cat tool to take that file, print it out to the command line, and basically pipe it over to GPG and pass the dash dash decrypt option. So if you press enter like that, as you can see, we get the original message. Hi guys, this is Billy and this is my encrypted message. If you guys are wondering, by the way, the reason I don't have to specify the key when I do GPG dash dash decrypt is because the fingerprint is actually included as the metadata in the key. So if, for example, I do the same thing uh, but set the recipient to my personal GPG key, which is alex at denshi.org, and then I run the same encrypted message.txt gpg dash dash decrypt command again. As you can see, it knows that it was encrypted with my key, which is my actual GPG key that I use for my emails and stuff. So essentially the fingerprint and that information for the key is included as metadata in the key so that you don't really have to know who it's addressed to to figure out that, okay, this looks like this was a message with Billy as the intended recipient. So you can just do GPG dash dash decrypt and it automatically decrypts stuff for you and it figures out exactly who that message was meant for. One last note on text encryption. If you send a message like, I don't know, hi guys, this this is my secret message and you pass it by gpg dash dash encrypt and then dash r billy j at uh, billy j at example.org over there and you press enter you're gonna get a bunch of garble nonsense now the way you get out of the 
this is by doing the dash dash armor option. So the dash dash armor option does this cool thing where it places this, this armor essentially around the message. This is the actual message, this armor around it. Um, that essentially allows you to copy paste this and put it say in an email or on a post or on something like that and just share it as a text message, not as some kind of separate file. So this is extremely useful if that's what you need to do, if you need to copy paste stuff. And also if you pass the dash dash armor option with a file, what it will do is it will create a file with the same name but with the .asc extension and that file itself will store all the information of the file in plain text. So this is a very, very long text file, uh, but essentially this is all the encrypted information for that image. All right, so that's all fine and dandy, but what about these famous cryptographic signatures that I keep hearing about? Uh, so essentially you can use GPG and a private key to sign anything, including any type of file or any kind of message to show that the person who holds a secret key was the one responsible for signing it. So for example, if I need to promulgate an important message to people that people might not trust is actually mine or might think that was tampered with, I can sign that message with my secret key and then anybody with my public key can go and access that message and figure out that it was indeed signed by me if they're provided with the signature. So the way that you do that is, let's say for example, I come up with a message called, hi guys, this is Denshi, or you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to the Billy example. Hi guys, this is Billy. I'm getting married to Amy next week. Just like that. I am so excited. So <laughs> he, sound, he sure sounds excited with that period. So what we can do is we can take, take this text message and pipe it over to GPG and we can pass the dash dash clear sign option. So the clear sign option essentially refers to us signing clear text and getting a clear output. And then we have to pass the dash u option to actually pick billyj at example.org to make sure that is the key we're actually signing this with. So if you press enter, as you can see, you're gonna get a prompt for the password again because I let the timeout happen. So I'm gonna do one, two, three, four in here. Uh, but then you're gonna get this signature. So you're gonna have a PGP signed message over here, which is, hi guys, this is Billy. I'm getting married to Amy next week. I'm so excited. And then you have a signature, which essentially lets you know that that message was was indeed Billy. So what we can do is we can take this information and we can redirect it using the angle bracket to signed-message.txt. So if we open up signed-message.txt, as you can see, it's got the message and the signature. So now what we can do is do gpg dash dash verify and then pass the file in this case, which is sign message.txt. And then all we got to do is press enter. And as you can see, it says good signature. So it says the signature is perfectly fine and the message is indeed real. So yes, Billy is getting married next week. Outstanding. What you can do in it is if you modify the message at any level. So for example, I'm going to do, I'm getting married to, instead of Amy, I'm going to do, I don't know, uh, Amelia, even if it's a minor change like that, like a couple of letters, what will happen is if you, if you try to verify it again, it will say bad signature from Billy John right there. So if the message or the signature changes in any capacity at all, what will happen is the signature will fail. Now you can do this exact same thing with a file. So you can do GPG dash dash sign without the clear sign option, just dash dash sign. And then the user option dash u billy j at example.org and the file in this case, I'm going to do picture.jpg like last time. And what this will do is it will generate a file called picture.jpg.gpg just like before, but this is actually not just the file itself that's decrypted, but also a signature. So if you do gpg dash dash verify picture.jpg.gpg, it will say good signature. So if you want the file to be separate from the signature, you can do something called a dash dash detach dash sign. And this will actually create a separate file called picture.jpg.sig. And I'm just, I'm just gonna delete that um, GBG file over there because we don't really need that. So we have picture.jpg and just the signature alone. So the signature alone is just this garbled nonsense of stuff. And the picture of course is the picture. So if you wanna verify that the signature is valid, you can do GBG dash just verify the signature first and then the file. So if you do that, as you can see, it says good signature. But if we open GIMP and go into the file and start messing around with it, like for example, I'm gonna just, um, I don't know, I'm gonna color this island red or something like that. And then I press file and I overwrite the picture and modify it. 
uh, then what can happen is if we run the verify command again, as you can see, it says bad signature because the file itself has been modified. So using this signature feature, you can prevent files and messages that you want to go out there into the world from being modified by anybody in some malicious way by making sure that people can verify that it is indeed you sending those messages and files. All right, well, that pretty much does it for this comfy guide to GPG. Pretty much everything I talked about in today's video is available in a text guide that you can find in the description from my website, comfy.guide. But apart from that, I hope you enjoyed this comfy guide to GPG. I've been Denshi, goodbye.